Well, I've really enjoyed spending the last couple of weeks talking about the golden era of history that we call the millennium. As I stated before, the millennial reign, it is a prelude to the eternal state. And the eternal state is something I'm also very much looking forward to talking with you about. It, it comes in the final two chapters in Revelation. But between the glory of the thousand years and the resplendence of eternity, there is a very dark transition. Before we can get to chapter 21 of Revelation, we've got to finish out chapter 20. And that transition from time to eternity requires the consummate dealing of the one thing that God cannot allow to continue into eternity, and that is sin. And everything that has been stained, defiled by sin, it must meet with the fires of God's holiness. You've heard it said before that history is his story. The ending of history is an un unembellished account of a story, uh, of, of the story of how time ends, how creation ends. And because it is his story, God gets to tell us the ending. And the thing is, we have no loose ends. There's incredible finality about the passage we're about to look at in verses 7 through 15. We're about to see the final expression of sin and rebellion, the final judgment and disposing of Satan, the final judgment of all sinners. And it's actually the final judicial act of God. After that, that event, God will never again adorn himself with his judicial robe. It is the final destination of all created beings. It is the final moment where the second hand of time ceases to turn. It is the final destruction of the old heaven and the old earth. See, there has to be an end to the history of time before there can be a beginning of the timeless. And that entire transition from time to eternity is described to us in nine verses. Verses 7 through 15. And what it lacks in length, it's going to make up for with some very important details that we can glean. Uh, I'm going to do my best to abbreviate some of these things, but there's so much important information in these verses. Two things that I want to share with you briefly today, and that is a final rebellion and a final reckoning. So up till now, we've been talking about the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Today we see how that ends in verse 7. So verses 7 through 10, we see the final rebellion. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for, the, for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. The fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now this may seem like a very surprise ending to a perfect thousand-year kingdom. But it really shouldn't surprise us when we understand the potency of the sin nature. What does the Bible say about the heart? It's deceitful deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who can know it. And so for that thousand years, remember there are people in their mortality, in their sin, who survived the period of tribulation. The saved individuals who were admitted will, into the kingdom will have children, and their children will have children. And for a thousand years you will have the propagation of humanity, millions, perhaps billions of people who are born in their sin. And while there is great restriction placed on the sinful actions of man, the sin is still present in their heart. And as you all know, the sin nature is irrepressible apart from the inner workings of God. So therefore, you will have people during the kingdom of Christ who will give an outward expression of their loyalty. They will pay homage to him at that time. Every knee will bow because Jesus will rule with a rod of iron just because they bow before him physically doesn't mean they've enthroned Christ in their heart. It's like Jesus said of the Pharisees, they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So after that thousand years, it says once it's completed, you notice that in verse 7, God is going to allow for that suppressed sinfulness of humanity to find expression. And so in order to hasten that expression so God can deal with it, God does something very interesting here, and that is he releases Satan from his prison. Remember, Satan had been bound for a thousand years. 
And we see his character hasn't changed after a thousand years. He comes back on the scene, back to his old shenanigans, turning the hearts of men against God. And what's amazing to me is that he's able to gather an army of people who lived in that kingdom period. It says the number was as the sand of the seashore. Those people had been raised in a perfect environment. And you wonder, how could this happen? It was a perfect environment. Well, it shows the sinfulness of sin. You know, that sin is, by nature, not logical. It's irrational. This action of these people, it's irrational. But just remember, the very first sin that was ever committed was committed by who? By the devil. And where did he commit that sin? In a perfect heaven. And not only did he sin, he was lifted up in pride and in deciding he wanted the glory that God had, he wanted that for himself. But he was able to convince a third of the angels to defy God. And those, those angels, and I don't know how many a third of the angels would be, millions or billions or what that would be, but that's a lot of angels to convince who are living in a perfect environment that he could offer them something better than God could. All it took was in one interaction with Eve. They were in a perfect environment as well. And once again, he was able to convince humanity that he could offer them something better than God. So he will, he will gather this army of people, many of whom have had their sins repressed, and they're finally glad to find expression for that sinfulness. And this army will create a distinction between those who are the genuine subjects of the kingdom and those who are the counterfeits. Satan's release is intentional to bring about this outcome that at that moment people will have to decide do I stand with Christ the King or do I stand against him? It has to be decisive so God can decisively judge it. And that's exactly what he does in verse 9. And this army comes up, they camp around Jerusalem, and it says that fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Not only that, again, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. This is Satan's final rebellion. This is humanity's final rebellion. And we see without any great fanfare, God just takes Satan and he throws him right there into the lake of fire, where it says the Antichrist and the false prophet also are. But God isn't done with fire, and God isn't done with hell, as we move on to our second point, which is the final reckoning. This is verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead and the great, the great and the small standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, the death and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If any man's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Before we talk about this white throne and its occupant, let's address this statement, a very interesting statement in verse 11, that in the presence of this white throne and in the presence of him who sat upon it, it says, heaven and earth fled away and no place was found for them. So human history has just ended, and with it, time. God, he is about to deal with all human sin, and the first thing he does is he deals with everything that has been tainted, cursed by human sin, which would be the heavens and the earth. This is actually a picture of God uncreating. He's uncreating the fallen earth and the fallen heavens. He's rendering everything to nothing. Everywhere to nowhere. It says there was no place found for them. Second Peter chapter 3 gives us a picture of what is going to happen at that moment. In 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. The elements would be what? The atoms, right? That's the elements that make up everything. The most fundamental part of creation will be dissolved and melted 
Now, scientists say that this is impossible. They say that matter, it can't really be created or destroyed. It can just be altered. But they're wrong in both cases. It can be created, and it can be destroyed, and it, will be, it has been created by the same person who will destroy it. And by the way, those who are overly concerned with what man is doing to the earth, just wait until they see what God does with it. So in this setting of nothingness, this is where you see this great white throne. Say, Pastor, what does that look like? Setting of nothingness. Does that mean it's just floating out there in space? No, because space doesn't exist. Nothingness. So I have a hard time imagining that. No, you have an impossible time imagining that because it's beyond our conception. But we are going to essentially see the nothingness that existed before creation. And there within that nothingness, we will see something, something very significant, a great white throne. It's actually from this throne and its occupant that it seems that the earth and the heavens have, it says they fled from the throne and him who sits upon it. As if everything in that moment that has been defiled by sin can no longer retain its existence in the presence of such a holy, perfect God. This throne is great because of its majesty and the weighty decision being decided upon it. It is white because of its purity. It is a throne because of its sovereignty. The one who sits on it is going to render a verdict for all of humankind. This is the seat of absolute judicial authority. Now, who is it that sits upon this throne? Well, we have some indications in John chapter 5. In verse 22, it says, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Verse 27, he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. The authority has been granted to Christ. It says, because he is the Son of Man. Because he is God, but because he's also man. And he is the only perfect man who's ever existed, who's in a position to judge. We're not in a position to judge one another, but Jesus Christ, the perfect man, is. And further, it says in Acts chapter 17, in verse 31, because he, God, has a fixed day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. God will judge this world in righteousness through a man, and that man, of course, is, is Christ. Now, what else is present in this scene that John describes to us in Revelation? In verse 12, I saw the dead. So there are people. And then the other thing you'll notice in verse 12 and 13 is he saw books. You notice how these individuals are referred to here that are present before the throne, he calls them the dead. A very tragic description because these are people at this moment who live and move and have their being in the sense that they are alive, but he doesn't refer to them as the living. He doesn't even refer to them as the living dead. He just refers to them as the dead because death is now what characterizes these individuals. Life no longer characterizes these people who will stand before the throne. I'll explain the books in a moment as well. I do want to remind you that at this time, believers will already have their resurrected bodies. We will not be standing before the white throne judgment. We were part of what the Bible calls the first resurrection back in chapter 20, verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power but they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. In other words, this scene of death has nothing to do with us. We have our resurrection bodies. The first resurrection happened in stages, if you recall, of the rapture. That is when we as the church will receive our new bodies, our glorified bodies. And seven years later, at the second coming of Christ, when he literally comes back to reign, is when the Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, will receive their resurrected, glorified bodies. And so we have our bodies. This is uh, another resurrection. The resurrection unto judgment that Jesus spoke of in John 5. And this includes all of the unbelievers of all ages, billions upon billions of people. 
See, the only thing remaining out of the old creation as it was dissolving away were the bodies of the dead. You notice that it talks about the graves giving up the dead and the, the sea giving up its dead for those who had ocean burials or died at sea. In other words, that while everything is dissolving away, these bodies come forth and remain, and they are reconstituted. They are united with departed souls, the souls of the dead, those who are now presently in a place the Bible calls Hades. There's a difference between hell, the lake of fire, and Hades. Hades is something of a, uh, a holding cell, if you will. Just think of it as a person who's in a local jail awaiting a trial, and when they're sentenced, they are then sent to their permanent location at a prison. Jesus described Hades in Luke chapter 16. Many would say that's just a parable when Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus. No, Jesus in his parables never used names. These were two individuals. They were real people who died, and Jesus gave us a glimpse of what happened to the righteous, what happened to the wicked, and described this place of torment where the souls presently are awaiting this final judgment. So we as believers expect to receive our glorified bodies, what these individuals have, you might say, is an unglorified body. Those bodies are not after the image of the resurrected Christ, not like unto his glorious body. No, these bodies, though they are immortal, they are designed for one thing. They are not designed to feel the sensations of pleasure and enjoyment as ours will be someday, but rather they will be given immortality in those bodies for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to eternally survive the fires of God's wrath. They are not glorified bodies because there's nothing glorious about their future. These resurrected sinners, they will stand before the throne. This is the last day of God's court, and this is not like the courts that we have here on earth. This is a different kind of judgment at this court you have a judge, but you have no jury. You have a prosecutor, but no defender. You have swift, uh, swift judgment, but no rebuttal, no cross-examination. You have a sentence with no appeal, a punishment with no parole, and a prison with no escape. And this is a truly unbiased court. You notice that it says that the great and small are present. Those who on earth were the big shots, those who were the nobodies, the emperors, the paupers, the Hitlers, the Stalins, and your neighbors, perhaps, down the street. These summons to appear before this throne are not to determine your destination. If you're present at that judgment, that means hell is the destination. There is not one person who will be present at the judgment, or at the, the judgment of the great white throne who will not share it in the same destination, which is hell. Now, this isn't about the fact of their punishment. It's about the degree of their punishment. That's what this judgment is all about. There are degrees of punishment in hell. You notice the books that it mentions. It says that they are judged by their deeds, which are written in the books. And what that tells us is that God is keeping in his omniscience accurate records of every thought, every word, every deed of all sinners of all time. We see another mention of the books in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. Verse, the end of verse 9, His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were burning fire, the river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Luke chapter 8, Verse 17, Jesus said, For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known or come to light. These individuals will be judged for their deeds. <clears throat> it's very interesting because as Christians, we talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Remember that? That's the judgment before which we stand. It's different than a, a judgment for condemnation. It's actually a judgment of reward or loss of reward. But again, Jesus, it says, will... He will make his determinations based upon our works as Christians. Now, those works do not determine the destination. We're already there. We're already in heaven. But what they do determine is the degrees of honor that God will bestow upon us as his people 
and basically our place in heaven. The deeds of the, the lost, however, again, they're not determining the destination itself. That's already been decided, but what's being determined are the degrees of condemnation, essentially a person's place in hell. So Romans chapter 2, verse 5 talks about how there are those who are piling up or storing up wrath. So some people are storing up more wrath for themselves than others. Matthew chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus here is talking to his disciples whom he is sending out with the word of the gospel to preach to everyone around and talks about going into a city and being rejected and this is what he says to his disciples whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or of the city shake the dust off your feet truly i say to you it will be more tolerable for the land of sodom and gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city you may be surprised to know who is going to endure the, the greatest condemnation you would think well the hitlers and the stalin surely you get guilty of all kinds of egregious crimes, certainly that they will in, they will have much wrath stored up for themselves. But what Jesus said here is very insightful because you remember Sodom and Gomorrah and you remember how wicked that city was. So wicked that God destroyed it and poured out his wrath upon it. But see, Sodom and Gomorrah was filled with people who did not know the true God. Perhaps had, had, had never heard of the true God. But Jesus says to his disciples, it's those who reject the truth of the gospel. Those are the ones who have the greatest condemnation. He says it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for those who have rejected your word. Jesus even describes a scene where at that judgment, there will be those who stand before Christ and say, Lord, Lord, many good works have we done in your name. And they plead their goodness, their good works, maybe even done in the name of religion or in the name of God himself. And Jesus says that his reply will be, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Because essentially what you have are people who are religious. They went to church, they walked the walk, they talked the talk. But when it was all said and done, they weren't depending on Christ for their salvation. They were depending on their own righteousness. Judas was the poster child of the counterfeit Christian, right? Because he walked the walk, he talked the talk, he was with the disciples, so much so that, that none of them even suspected him of being the one who would betray Christ. He heard the words of Christ, but in the end, he was a counterfeit, he was an imposter. And Jesus said of him, woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man, it would be better for him had he never been born. It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? To think that the people who will receive the greatest condemnation at this day will be the many of the average churchgoers who go to church and week after week they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they continue to cling to their own righteousness. They reject Christ. But just having heard the gospel and rejected it and rejected it and rejected it means that they will be held to a higher account before the bar of God. That is scary. Now, you might ask the question, is there any hope on that day that those people, as they stand before God, that their good works would outweigh their bad works? And the person who would ask that question doesn't understand that this throne has a, this judgment has a standard, and the standard is perfection. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We think of sin as all the bad stuff that we do. But you realize even in the good stuff that we try to do, it still can be tainted by our sinfulness so that we continue to fall short of perfection. So we miss the mark. We fall short. It's like in a basketball game. You know, you can measure how far someone has missed the basket. You know, they throw up the ball and it misses the backboard and the, and the hoop entirely. Another person might throw it up and it'll hit the rim and you ever see it spin around and pop out at the last second. And you might say, well, that person got closer than the other to getting a point. But the, the reality is neither of them get points because the standard of the game is that in order to get the points, it has to go through the basket. And God has a standard and his standard is perfection. It doesn't matter how close we think we come to it, or if some think they come closer than, than others, they will still miss the mark and not get credit because the standard is perfection. Now, once the deeds are measured, verse 15, chapter 20, 
In verse 14, the death in Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not, not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Upon handing down the sentence of guilt, determining the level of condemnation, it says that God will cast them into this place that we call hell, the lake of fire, a place of physical, emotional, spiritual torment, and it will be conscious torment, and it is never ending. One of the most common objections that I hear to a passage like this is, how could a loving God throw a person into hell? How could a loving God do that? Well, the fact is, God himself says, I take no delight in the death of the wicked. God takes no delight in the death of a wicked. Honestly, I, don't, I take no delight in talking about the death of the wicked. Because God's heart would be that none should perish. It says judgment is his strange work. God delights in mercy, so much so that he exercised his infinite power to provide a way for a sinner to escape this judgment so they could come to know Jesus as Savior, so they never have to know him as judge. Do you realize a person, by not choosing Christ in this life, they're choosing hell. Their choice. They live their life saying to God, essentially, I, I don't want anything to do with you. You want anything to do with your salvation? God gives them their desire for eternity, where they, they will have nothing to do with God or with his salvation. There's another common thing I hear when talking about heaven and hell. The person will dismiss it and say, you know, I'm not really worried about that. I'll, I'll deal with that in the afterlife. I'll deal with that after I die. Let me ask you a question. When you're planning a vacation, do you go down to the local airport, get on a plane, and decide at that moment once you've stepped onto the plane, you know, I'd really like to go to the Bahamas today. Well, it happens that the flight plane of that plane is Siberia, so you're going to go to Siberia because it doesn't matter at that moment once you're standing in the plane where you want to go. What matters is the destination that that plane is determined to go. If you're planning for your, your future vacation, what do you do in advance? You buy the ticket. You make the plans. You realize once you die, there is no change in your destination. There is a ticket. A ticket that God has offered you to heaven. One which he has purchased. Now you have to take it. You have to possess it. You don't have to buy it. He bought it. But as a gift, he's, he's offering you a ticket to heaven. He guarantees your flight to heaven. But without that ticket, there's only one other one other plane, there's only one other flight plane. And once you're on that plane, there's no getting off and there's no way to change where it ends up. You know, when it comes to judgment in this life, there are really, really only two options. You can choose today, or in this life, to judge yourself, to admit your guilt, to admit your sin. Lord, I'm guilty. And ask God for pardon, which he will grant you based on the blood of his son, because Jesus, he took your life sentence. That's what the cross was. It was your life sentence, your eternal sentence in hell. Jesus took upon himself. He, he experienced that wrath of God on your behalf. So he can offer you pardon. So that you, you're accepting essentially how he was judged, so you won't have to be judged. You're forgiven. The other option is you can live with the attitude that you're a good person and you think your good works will outweigh your bad. So you're going to take your chances when you get to this throne that we're talking about today. But friend, you are not prepared for the outcome because the reality is when you get before this throne, God is not putting your good works over against your bad works on the scale. That's not how it works. He's putting all your works on one side of the scale and on the other side of the scale is God and his perfection. And if you don't measure up to that, which you won't, then there is only one sentence. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Let me just talk about fear in closing for a moment. Let me put a picture in your mind. And if you indulge it and you actually do this, I think it will evoke a certain emotion. I want you to imagine 
as the stuff of your nightmares comes true, and you here in this assembly today found yourself standing right in the midst of the assembly naked. How would you feel? Well, you would probably feel exposed, vulnerable. Like Adam, you would probably feel some shame. But then imagine as you're exposed, standing naked amongst all these people, that someone in the crowd who knows you better than anyone else begins to expose something else about you. They begin to call out your sins, your most secret sins, the things that you would never want any person to ever know. Be a fearful, terrorizing moment. And that would be just standing before your fellow fallen man, who in essence has no real right to judge, because it's not our place, because we're fellow sinners. But now imagine standing naked before the throne of God. Well, you won't be adorned in any clothing of any righteousness as the saints are. You will be standing fully exposed. Standing before the universal sovereign of whom it is said that all things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And there, sitting upon the throne, the all-powerful, the all-knowing God, glaring into your eyes without the slightest hint of mercy or grace, as he begins to openly tell you all of your darkest secrets. As he opens his books, and one by one, he tells you your most egregious imaginations, your most vile words that you've spoken, very depraved actions. If that is you, you will be like a leaf shaking and trembling in the wind of a hurricane in that moment. You will know terror like you have never known. And when the verdict is pronounced, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Your eternity will be sealed, and it will have just begun. You will experience what the Bible calls the second death, and the second death is where physically and spiritually you are separated from God for all of eternity in a place where his wrath burns and is never quenched. I know what some of you are thinking this morning. You're thinking, Pastor, I don't like this sermon. I don't like this message. And in honesty, again, I don't have any delight in talking about the death of the wicked, just as God has no delight in the death of the wicked. But I am under divine obligation because Revelation chapter 22, at the very end, it pronounces a very severe warning that we do not add to the words of this book of Revelation or take away from it. There are many pastors who would exclude the last part of chapter 20. They don't want to talk about hell with their people because, you know, in preaching about hell, they're concerned that, oh, I, I might make my people uncomfortable. I might make them afraid. Friend, I would so much rather you be discomfort, discomfortable in this life, thinking that that could be you one day. But knowing that you're still alive in this life and have an opportunity to change the outcome, to change your eternal destination, because that opportunity exists now in this life. That's why the Bible says, now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait till tomorrow. You don't know if you'll be alive tomorrow. None of us do. You get this settled. I would so much rather you be discomfortable now than when you're in eternity and you're suffering under that wrath, and you have no ability to undo it. And if you are not a believer and follower of Christ, your attitude is, you know, I'm not afraid. You should be. But the good news is you don't have to be. Because God has extended to you a free ticket. A ticket that costs him very, a, a very great amount. It costs him the blood of his son. He wants you to come to know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Because knowing Him as Savior means you never have to stand before Him as judge. 
I am so glad I don't have to be there on that day, standing before this throne. I praise God this morning, as I've been studying through this this week, I was just praising the Lord, thank you. Thank you that I'm not going to be before that throne because it terrifies me to think of those who will be standing. I think of my loved ones, my friends, my family, the different people in my life, imagining them at that moment, living under the terror of God's angry gaze. It's, it just breaks your heart. So friends, you don't have to be at this judgment. You can know Christ today. And it closes by talking about the book of life. Any person whose name is in the book of life, we don't have to worry it's only those whose names are not in the book of life. How do you get your name in the book of life? You accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. 